Hello brothers and sisters from Christ. We're going to try this outdoors. It's gotten very windy today, so I might have to redo this inside. So we're going to try to do it outside. Hopefully the mic, I don't have the mic on me. So we're going to give it a try. What I want to do is do a video. Uh, just I'm just going to go over just a few verses that are verses that are most often, oftentimes misquoted or misused. And this is not tons of them. I wanted to leave it open-ended because brothers and sisters of Christ, I'm not always going to be here. Okay? As far as God could take me home today, tomorrow, who knows? Uh, God can take anybody in ministry home. God can take us home. My point is, is that YouTube, the platform YouTube, might not be there for Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women try for men and women, men and women to talk and fellowship, but men to do ministries. So the point is, is you got to learn to fellowship among yourselves, do your own Bible studies, and give good testimonies. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to do is go through here and talk about some verses and testify how I've seen it in my life and then leave, the, leave it open and say, okay, brothers and sisters in Christ, chime in in the comment section. Write down some verses of your own that you say, well, I've seen this in my life where Christians will misquote this verse. Whether they're quoting a Bible perversion and they're supposed to be King James Bible believer and it's hard sometimes going from those books to the real word of God, King James Bible believer. King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English. Or some people are misusing scripture and you've seen it in your life and in your experience and your walk with the Lord as a Christian. Okay. So one of the first verses we're going to turn to is Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Okay. Okay. We hear this a lot. Pride cometh before a fall. Be careful. If you're too prideful, you're going to fall. I've seen this and I've heard people make comments, pride goes before a fall, and I just, I'm like, is that what the Bible says? Let's read what the Bible says. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. So a haughty spirit goes before a fall, pride goeth before destruction. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, let's read the De uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary, and let's understand that a haughty spirit I believe is a predecessor to getting too prideful before destruction. Because a fall, you can stumble and fall, and God can get you back up, and you're like, Lord, sorry, I got too high minded. What was it? A uh, haunty spirit. Destruction, God will destroy somebody who gets way too prideful. Okay? So let's look up the word pride. Inordinate self esteem. An unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority and talents beauty, wealth, accomplishments, rank, or elevation in office, which manifests itself in lofty airs, distant, reserve, and often in contempt of others. So it's an unreasonable content, conceit of one's own superiorities. They get so prideful, okay? Their talents are so good, they're so beautiful, they have so much wealth, accomplishments, rank, you know, you can get so prideful, um, you know, nobody can correct you or elevation in office. But what about haughty? You have a haughty, notice it's a lowercase s spirit. It's talking about your spirit becoming haughty. Look up the word haughty. Proud and disdainful. You say, well it says proud. Right? But here's what I believe is the key. Having a high opinion of oneself with some contempt for others. Okay, You can get lofty, you can get arrogant, uh, but mainly you have a high opinion of oneself. When you get such a high opinion of yourself where I'm doing good and my life is doing great and look at me, I, I I'm, I'm just seem to be doing so great and you get so high minded, I'm, I'm just better than that person. And, I mean, you know, and you can fall. God will cause you to fall to wake you up and open your eyes. If you ignore God, get up and go, that's the world's fault and that's the enemy's fault and that's this and that and whatever. Whatever you do, what's going to happen? Well, that Holy Spirit's going to turn to pride. And then pride goes before destruction. Okay, Some people misuse that and try to say someone's getting prideful. Someone's getting prideful. And they could. They might not. But oftentimes I've seen people misuse it. The person's not getting prideful. Right? But there's times where people do get prideful. I pray I don't ever get prideful, but I know I will. I know I have been in the past. Okay? So remember, pride goes before destruction, not a fall. A haughty spirit goes before a fall. 
you get so prideful and so puffed up, it will destroy you. Not just I slipped and fell and I, I got back up. No, destroy. Destruction is what it talks about. So there's an example of a verse that I believe in my experience, what I've seen people comment with a lot in the last four years of my uh, four to five years of being saved. They misquote that. I misquoted it as a lost professing Christian. Okay? Yeah, just pride goes before fall. No, pride will destroy you. That's why when you start to see the Holy Spirit coming up, you need to push it down. Okay, uh, I don't have a high opinion of oneself. I need to be humble. I need to be meek. Mm -hmm. Next one, uh, one of the big ones is God loves you, present tense. They'll say God loves you. This is just another verse. Okay, we're just going through verses. Some have to do with gospel. Some have to do with instruction and righteousness. It's just anything, brothers and sisters Christ. Anything that you've experienced, put it down in the comment section. So, God, present tense, loves you. And here's where they turn to. John 3, 16. For God so loved, that just proved him wrong. For God so loved, past tense, the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They keep going, it says... Uh, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, Jesus Christ, might be saved. He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. Okay? We are all born into a world of sin. We are born in this uh, sinful flesh. We sinned against God. We are condemned to hell. That's the law of sin. I don't want to go into a big study, but there's the law of sin and death, and there's the law of sin. The law of sin means that this is a body of flesh, it's a sinful flesh, and I'm going to struggle with sin till the day I die, saved or lost. This body's going to sin. I don't want to sin. It doesn't justify sinning against God, but that's the law of sin. When we get saved, we're going to struggle with the flesh, and when we fall, we're supposed to get back up through Jesus Christ. Okay, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow Him. The law of sin and death, the word death, means the moment you've sinned, you're worthy of hell. You're going to hell. You deserve to go to hell. The law of sin and death says, you sinned against God, an almighty righteous God, you're going to go to hell and get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. That's your destination. Okay, it's almost like saying, here's the judgment that's been set, but the punishment hasn't been carried out yet. Okay? You don't, that punishment, you can avoid that punishment through Jesus Christ. You want God's love, you go to the cross. You turn to Romans chapter 2, verse 7. To them who by patience, continuance, and well-doing seek for the glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. There's the key words, obey the truth. Remember, we keep hearing about obey the gospel, obey the gospel. The gospel is truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also the Gentile, for there's no respect of persons with God. Anybody can get saved. But God does not, present tense, love everybody. Okay? He so loved the world, past tense. Okay? Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. Past tense. God's love is not on a Christ-rejecting sinner who refuses to repent. We'll get to that later on refuses to repent, okay, refuses to confess both in prayer to show he's not ashamed that it's coming from the heart, not just the head, head knowledge, okay. God's love is not on a Christ-rejecting sinner. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, he's talking to save sinners, and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There we get the obey, the truth, that we read in Romans chapter 2, verse 7. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed 
in that day. People going out and testifying, God changed my life, He saved me, I'm a wretch, I deserve to go to hell, but God saved me. He overthrew the verdict that I'm guilty. He set me free. I'm still guilty, maybe I'd not say overthrow. Basically, He took on the punishment for me. But He's the one that set me free. If it wasn't for Him, I'd be going to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. Okay? And those who reject Him, look what happened to Him. That's not love. Okay? God does not, present tense, love the whole world. So this is one of those missed, rep, uh, I'd say misquoted, but more than anything, probably misused, because I, you'll see this a lot with people, brothers and sisters of Christ, professing Christians. I made this mistake as a newly saved Christian. I might slip up and make the mistake in the future, but you'll say something, and then you'll read a verse that goes against what you said. See, God loves you, and then they quote a verse that said loved, past tense, not present tense. And they don't tell them about God's wrath and God's judgment that's upon them. Okay? That's another verse I see people mess up. Next verse is um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Throw out some of the big ones. Judge not, lest ye be judged. I'm not doing a big study on this. I'm just throwing out some verses saying, hey, these are ones I've heard people mess up. Um, I had a family member growing up that would always say that. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Okay. I've heard it in my lost life as a professing Christian, you know. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, what does the Word of God all actually say? It says, Judge not that ye be not judged. Okay. Now right there, if you stopped right there, it would seem like they're saying that you're not supposed to judge and you won't be judged by other people. Well, we got to keep reading. It says, Judge not that ye be not judged. But what judgment is it talking about there? you got to keep reading. Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. In other words, if you judge wrong, you're going to be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why holdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? In other words, it's talking about hypocrisy. I'm telling people that... You shouldn't be playing video games. It's sinful and wicked. And then I turn around and I justify video games. Someone catches me playing video games and I justify it. Or I'm playing video games and have no problem with video games, but then I turn around and tell other people, you're not supposed to be playing video games. That's hypocritical judgment. That's the part there where it says, judge not. Okay? Verse 4, Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thy own eye. Thou hypocrite. It's talking about being a hypocrite. Hypocritical judgment. First cast out the beam of thy own eye. Get your heart right with the Lord. Get that out of your life. Start living right. Then, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Notice it says thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. In other words, it's saying you are to. Get it out of your life. Get your heart right with the Lord then you can help that brother or sister in Christ. If you've got that problem, you're not going to be able to help somebody. You're going to be a hypocrite. Okay? Don't be a hypocrite. So that's another verse that um, people misuse. They, they misquote it. Just not, judge not lest you be judged. Just another verse thrown out there. Next one is, is how many of you guys have seen the t-shirts? To fear God is to know God. <laughs> I had one of those t-shirts, believe it or not. The fear of the Lord. Fear God, know God. You know. They try to equivalent that fearing God just means you know Him. That's all. You know, you read this Bible and you know God. That's all it means. But is that what the Bible says? Proverbs 9.10. Turn to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, wisdom is not something that you can learn as far as study, head knowledge. Wisdom is like life application. You learn something from experience. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In your life, as you fear the Lord as a saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, you're going to learn some experiences, good and bad. And the bad I mean by me making the mistake and, and that fear of the Lord comes in. I should have feared you, Lord. 
this wouldn't have happened if I'd have feared you. Okay. Here's the last half. This is where they get mixed up. And it says, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So they'll cut that up and say, the fear of the Lord is to know God. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. Knowing God. That's not what it says. Okay, It's talking about actual fear. I should fear God when I get tempted, fall into temptation, choosing to sin. When I fall into temptation, I should have the fear of God in me to say, I don't want to do that. God could punish me. And He will. If he, if the Bible talks about chastisement. I don't want to do that. God will punish me. If I do that and fall into it, bad things are going to happen to me. I fear the Lord. It's talking about actual fear. Uh, turn to Psalms 111.10. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, 111.10. Sorry about that. Psalms 111.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There we see it again. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. It's not about just knowledge, head knowledge. It's taking that knowledge and applying it in your life and obeying God's commandments. If you fear God, He's going to say, do this. Kind of like a parent telling a child, you will do this. That child is supposed to have fear of disobeying that parent. They say, don't do this. There should be fear there. Fear of reprisal. Fear of punishment. Fear of letting them down. Yeah. Evidence that you, are un that you understand God are doing His commandments. There's the example we read there. John 14, 23, you don't have to turn here, but I always quote this to people. People always talk about love. I love the Lord. Love is a, is a feeling that I have deep. It's a burning in the bosom and it's a feeling. Well, no, John 14, 23 says that Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If they're making their abode with him, wouldn't they reveal a little bit of who they are? Knowledge? Like learning who Jesus is? Who God is? Yeah. But true love for Jesus Christ is what? Keeping his word. It's an action. Fearing the Lord is going to motivate you to keep his word and keep his commandments. And I'm going to go ahead because here's another one where people say, well, see, see, we got you now, we got you now. Proverbs 1.7. Let's go ahead and turn to Proverbs 1.7. It talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. See, see, to fear God is to know God. Keep reading. But fools despise what? Wisdom and instruction. It goes back to wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge it's talking about there is not head knowledge. It's talking about wisdom. You learn in your walk with the Lord, and you make mistakes, and you fall flat on your face, and you learn to fear God. So when God's Word says, don't do that, you don't do that. <laughs> I've made the mistake of saying, well, you know what, Lord, maybe I can, or I got it. No, and I fall flat on my face. And I've learned to fear God. I've seen chastisement in my life. I've seen, seen bad things happen to my life because of my sin and mistakes that I've made as a Christian. Okay? There's supposed to be fear there. But the biggest push is, is they're trying to take the fear away and saying it's just knowing God. Just knowing God. There's no wisdom, you know, in fearing, like actually being afraid. Because they also go to the verse of, we're not given a spirit of fear, but of peace. That's talking about the world. God's given us a spirit of peace when it comes to the world. But when it comes between us and them, or us and God, we're supposed to fear God when it comes to sin, when it comes to disobeying His commands. Okay? So that's another big one that people miss up and just try to make it where I, I don't want the fear. I want to eliminate the fear so I can just do what I want. You know. Yeah, I, I sin, but, you know, whatever. And you have those people. They like to misquote it. Fear is fear. You fear the Lord. Okay. The next one. The love of money is the root of all evil. 
But what do people usually say? I wrote that down wrong. They say that money is the root of all evil. How many of you heard people say that? I've heard it said when I was a false convert a lot. Money is the root of all evil. You can't be rich as a Christian. It's and I, I honestly, in these last days, how corrupt everything is, I agree. In these last days, I can't see some, a, a millionaire, billionaire Christian. They've had to have compromised. I understand that. Because in order to get that money, we're going to get into the verse. Turn to um, 1 Timothy 6.10. Because in order to get that money, what did you have to do? For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some have coveted after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's that love. But they loved that money so much, what did they have to do? They had to compromise. In these last days, to be a millionaire, billionaire, you have to compromise. If you're not compromising, you're not going to be, be a very wealthy, wealthy person. But on the other side, it doesn't mean you have to be poor, dirt poor. You know, <laughs> living off the streets this is the only shirt I got doesn't mean that okay you can have some money okay you can own some land you can own things it's saying the love of that money when you love that money what happens that money becomes a what false god turn to Luke chapter 16 verse 13 no servant can serve two masters for he either hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other you cannot serve God and mammon the love of money so when people come around it's that one word if you take out that one word love it destroys the whole thing I can't have money no you can you're just not supposed to love money you give God thanks give him glory for everything that you have it's a blessing from God you don't deserve it I don't deserve it mm -hmm. so that's another one here's one I've been kind of I think maybe I've misled people, and God kind of struck it hard on my heart. So as we read this, I'm going to use me as the example. I always keep telling people that you want to clean up your life, make sure you're reading your Bible every morning, reading your Bible every evening, and then of course I talk about prayer, and I talk about, which is good, and I talk about singing old hymns, which is really good. But I don't really hammer the most important part. So I hope maybe I'm behind the, my fault behind all this. So turn to Psalms 119.9. Right? What does the Bible say? How do you get sin out of your life? How do you clean up your life? Right? Is it just reading the Bible? That's all you do is read the Bible and your life will get cleaned up. Psalms 119.9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed there too according to thy word. What does that word heed mean? It means you're obeying. You're not just reading this book, you're obeying it. God says abstain from all appearance of evil, you abstain from all appearance of evil. If it talks about your imagination, vain imagination, all imagination is vain. Okay. I always tell myself when my mind starts to wander and I start thinking of things that daydreaming, whatever, Vain imagination, uh, usually God helps me, gets back on track, let's think of something good, a Bible study, some work that needs to get done. The Bible talks about how the meditation of your heart is supposed to be on Jesus continually. Okay? On His Word continually. So, if I've kind of pushed that, Psalms 119.11, okay, you jump down two verses, it says, Thy word have I hidden in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. I always say that. Memorize some scripture. Memorizing scripture is good. Reading your Bible every morning and every evening is necessary for a Christian, especially in these last days with temptation of the flesh, with the lost world. It's so important. But here's the thing. All of that becomes worthless. Memorizing scripture and reading scripture becomes worthless. And I'll say this. If you're not hiding it in your heart and heeding God's word and obeying it, applying it to your life. I was a false convert. I wasn't reading the King James Bible, but I was a false convert reading, you know, Bibles galore. I wasn't saved. Okay. My life was a mess. There was no changed life. Why? Because I didn't have God's Word, for one. And today there's a lot of King James only, uh, King James Bible believers that are false, and they read this book. 
Why are they false? Because they are not hiding God's word here. They never repented. We're going to get to that <laughs> the second time we've mentioned it. We're going to get to it. you got to heed. It says heed thereto according to thy word. You obey it. You submit yourself to it. God says do this, I'm going to do it. God says don't do this, I'm not going to do it. And how many of us have ignored God sometimes and fallen flat on our face? I'm raising my hand. Chiefest of sinners right here. I'm not saying that just to say it. I look at my life as a Christian. I have made some big mistakes in my life. I have fallen flat on my face time and time again. As a babe in Christ, and even in these last days as a mature Christian, there's times where I still fall flat on my face. I screw up. I make a mistake. I compromise. What does it all mean to compromise in this? You're not heeding the Word of God. I put it out of the camera. <laughs> Taking it out of the camera. You're taking this and putting it away. And you're not heeding, listening, and obeying the Word of God. Okay? So I kind of want to push that, brothers and sisters of Christ, that when I'm telling you to read the Bible and memorize scriptures, do cue cards and sing old hymns that come from the scriptures, um, oftentimes, it's not enough to do that, brothers and sisters of Christ. You've got to heed the Word of God. You've got to apply it to your life. God says that's wicked. Get it out. God says, hey, you're supposed to study to show thyself approved. You're supposed to be doing Bible studies. You're supposed to be reading the Word of God. You know, Don't do this. Do that. Okay, it need, You need to apply it to your life and heed it. Okay. Next one. Okay, You hear people say this. You clearly do not know your Bible. You need to study more. Okay. Now, that can be true when you're trying to discuss like doctrine and stuff like that. But when I read that, I heard somebody say that, I was like, but what happens when you, almost like what we just went through when it comes to sin, you're supposed to heed the Word of God. But how do you know when people are in words, they're debating, and it's just fighting with words, how do you know when somebody's really studying the Word of God and getting it? How do you know? Turn to 2 Timothy 2.15. See, they're simple little words. Remember, one of the biggest things about this ministry that God put on my heart is that words have meaning, and I need to learn that. And it's opened the book to me a lot when it comes to, okay, I need to make sure I know, I'm reading the words, I know the definitions of the words on, in context. And wherewithal shall, or no, um, study to show thyself approved unto God. See? What's the next part? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How do you know when someone's truly studying the Bible and getting it? Their life is showing it. They're applying it to their life. Their works line up with Scripture. Their life and how they're living their life lines up with Scripture. That's how you know when someone's really studying the Word of God. Okay? You can have people debating you know, theology and all this stuff, quoting scripture and it's throwing back at each other, but sometimes we forget, well, what kind of life are they living? You know? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Once again, I'm going back. There's action, though, that backs that up. How do you know they're spiritually concerned? Because the Holy Spirit opened this book to me, the Bible says, heed thy word, hide thy word in thy heart, obey. Jesus said, keep his words. That's an action. If a man love me, he shall, uh, if a man love me, he will keep my words. That's an action. It's not me having this Bible sitting on a shelf gathering dust. It's not me opening this and just reading it. It's applying it to your life. It's an action. James 1 5. But those who are not spiritually concerned, the reason I read that is tons of people can read this book. Some people can say, hey, I can tell you what the pre time of Jacob's trouble is. Well, do you believe it? No. But I can tell you what they believe, and I can show you scripture and everything. I can tell you what the post trib believe, and I can show you the scriptures they try to use, and so on and so forth. But how do you know when someone truly believes in the pre time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ? They're living every day like Jesus can come back any moment so I need to make sure to sanctify my life I'm trying to make sure that everything I do is about Jesus Christ and I'm pleasing God not my flesh Lord if there's something evil in my life get it out 
If I'm doing something wrong, help me to stop it, Lord, please. If I'm not doing something I'm supposed to do, help me to do it. Mm -hmm. James 1.5. There's a key word here. Going back to, you know, you need to study more. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. The Bible time and time again talks about wisdom. People always talk about intellect, knowing I can, these notes that I made, I can study them and do a test and try to pass the test. See, I passed the test. That's intellect, that's head knowledge. That's not wisdom. You want wisdom? God will give it to you, okay? Do this, action in your life, and you'll learn, wow, that's, my life's a lot easier when I'm obeying the Lord and doing this. The Bible says, don't do that, and you go, okay, Lord, I won't do it, and you see someone else do it, and you're like, wow, I almost did that. I don't, that could have been me, and sometimes it is, <laughs> because you don't listen. I don't listen sometimes. We need to listen to God, okay? This big thing about you need to study, uh, um, you clearly don't know your Bible, you need to study more. We also need to make sure people's lives reflect that when they're studying the Word of God, they're a workman, action, their works, how they're living their life. They need it not to be ashamed. Now the number thing, uh, 2 Timothy 4.3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts so they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables lust what keeps people from understanding this book the flesh what tries to pull you away from this book and go well maybe it'll be okay and you choose to sin you fall into temptation but you choose to sin that's your flesh okay? The lost world uses your flesh against you. Satan uses your flesh against you. I'm tired of this flesh. I'm waiting to go home. I'm tired of this flesh and I'm looking. But I'm looking by the life I'm living. I'm going to keep fighting this flesh and keep asking God to help me keep it down. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not my own strength. Jesus' strength. Okay. The flesh keeps you from understanding. Remember we talked about in some of my old studies. Some of you might be new. But Romans chapter 8 1 through 8, we're not going to read it, but it talks about being carnally minded and walking after the flesh and being spiritually minded and walking after the Spirit, capital S, Spirit. Okay? And that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. What keeps you from being able to understand this book? You don't have the Holy Spirit in you. Either the Holy Spirit's going to be in charge or your flesh is going to be in charge. You can't have both. When you hear people say, it's clearly you don't know your Bible, you need to study more. There's times where, yeah, I need to, to look into things and not be quick to jump on something. But we need to realize that studying this Bible ain't going to do much for you if you're not applying it to your life and living it. Right? You believe in a pre-time of Jacob's trouble? Look at my life. Look what God has done in me. He's changed my life. He's cleaned up my life. I'm living for Him. Everything is about Him now. He could come back any moment. I want to stand before him and have him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not look at me just shaking his head. Man, you just wasted your life as a Christian. That's evidence that someone truly believes in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. Someone can claim they believe in it, but does their actions show they do? They need to line up. That's the whole point. Okay. Um, last one, and then... Like I said, I'm going to open the floor to Brother and Sisters Christ making comments in the comment section. I am saved by faith alone. How many of us have heard this? I am saved by faith alone. What they're saying without actually saying it is, I saved myself with my faith. How many of us heard this? I'm saved by faith alone. And here's the, the thing. They'll turn around and quote a verse that disproves what they're saying. I'm saved by faith alone. Okay, let's read this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, because this is what they'll turn to. Mm -hmm. For by grace are ye saved. Okay, stop there for a second. For by grace are ye saved. So it's God's grace that saves us? Oh, yeah. But let's keep reading. How do we find that grace? Through faith. They take that and switch around. We're saved by faith. 
And they even th when you say faith alone, you just take God's grace out completely, not through God's grace. It's just, I'm saved by faith. I'm saved by my faith. It doesn't. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God. Not of yourselves. They turn faith into works. Not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. God's the one that does the saving. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You get saved, good works are going to follow. Follow. But it puts something in here because someone tried to correct me with it, but it didn't change anything. For last part says, Which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. They jump on the word should. Absolutely. Do I walk perfectly all the time with the Lord? Do you, brothers and sisters in Christ? You never sin anymore? You never make a mistake? Yes, we do. But this still says there's going to be a change in our life. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It's guaranteed. It's going to lead to good works. There will be a change in our life. There will still be some times we fail the Lord. Mm -hmm. But we read there, okay, it's grace that saves. It's God's grace. Um, I always throw this in there. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Repentance leads you to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. This is the number one reason so many people, we have so many false converts that are going to hell. Right here. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. You got to come to God broken having sorrow for your personal sins against Him. Not we're all sinners. I have this body of flesh. It's, I have no choice. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. Your personal sins against God. You have to have sorrow for it. Lord, I, I wish I never had sinned against you, Lord. I'm so sorry for sinning against you. I know what the cost of that sin is, and I deserve to go there. Hell. And then toss in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. I deserve to go there, Lord. I'm so sorry for sinning against you. Now, here's the thing. Does that save you? No. But what does that do? That leads to God's grace. That's why it says, to salvation. And people have worldly sorrow. They're sorry for the consequences. They're too sorrowful. They don't want to give this sin up. They don't want to give the world up. They don't want to give their flesh up. And we come across so many of them that claim to be Christians, and they're, they're, they have worldly sorrow. That's all they have. They don't have godly sorrow. Right? I was that person most of my life, starting at, I'd say, age 14, all the way up until I got saved five years ago. I'm 41 now. I'm kind of getting old over the hill. You know what I'm saying? I had worldly sorrow. I didn't have godly sorrow. Not one bit. But it leads to salvation. So God, so repentance, true biblical repentance, sorrow for your sins, personal sins against God. It doesn't save you. But it leads to salvation. It points you to God's grace. What's the next one? Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel, what's the, people always say repentance isn't the gospel. Repentance leads to salvation, God's grace. Repentance leads to the gospel. What's the gospel? The fin belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, death, burial, and resurrection. He died for your sins. He paid a price that you will pay if you continue to reject Jesus Christ. Okay? Not the death on the cross. What I mean by it is there's still a price to be paid. Jesus paid it. You owe Jesus now. What are you going to do? Most people are like, well, all I have to do is believe in Him. Then I'm just going to believe in Him. They skip repentance. 
They don't have sorry for their sins. They're just sorry that there's a consequence and there's a hell. And maybe this will be my insurance to get me out of hell, so I'll just believe in the big guy upstairs. Uh, no. If you truly repented, you're going to be sorry for your personal sins against him, and you're going to have sorrow for what Jesus went through on the cross because of you. Okay? He paid a price that you had to pay, and you're not going to be nailed to a cross, but if you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to burn in hell and then get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. But notice it says, to salvation. Does the gospel of belief in the gospel save you? No. It leads to salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is, has so much power, but it leads to salvation. God's grace has always been there from the very beginning, Genesis, all the way to Revelation. And he's dispensing his grace differently. How you find his grace. Best way to say it is how you find his grace throughout all these different, dis different dispensations is different. Okay? How do we find God's grace today? Through repentance. Through belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The gospel. Mm -hmm. To salvation. Gospel doesn't save, it leads. It's a power of God, and it's mighty full power. But it leads to salvation. What saves us? Mm -hmm. We already read what saves us. God's grace does. Romans 1.16 We already read that one, I'm sorry. Romans 10.8 But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto, there's that word again, salvation. What is salvation? Salvation has been God saving man. That's what salvation is. God saved man in the Old Testament. God saved man in the New Testament. Salvation has always been God saving man by what? His grace. But how do you find that grace? We've just read, you gotta go through repentance. You gotta go through belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now we read, you've gotta confess both to the Lord. Now I can go back into it again because people say, well what if you can't speak or something? There's tons of stories in the Bible where people were praying to God, their lips are moving, but no voice is coming out, and they're praying. You don't have to be speaking out loud to be praying to God and telling God. It has to happen here. Buttons of the heart, the mouth speaks. It happens here, first. That's where you're talking to the Lord. Hey, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. Lord, I am so sorry for the sins that I've committed against you. I'm no good. Lord, I believe in your Son. I believe in Jesus Christ, that He is God manifest in the flesh. He proved it. He died on the cross and rose again the third day to prove that He is God Almighty. And He paid the price that I should pay. Lord, please forgive me. Please have mercy on me, a sinner. Notice it says it leads to salvation. But does confessing both in prayer save you? No. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, save me. Who does the saving? God does the saving. So many people in this day and age, they love their faith alone because if they can say, I'm saved by my faith, they can justify living a sinful, wicked life as a Christian. They can justify having the world and calling themselves a Christian. If God saved me, His grace saved me, I belong to Him. He tells me what to do, and I do it. It's that simple. But when you've saved yourself, well then now you can do things how you want to do them and you, you can be as God's knowing good and evil. You get to decide what's right and wrong. You get to do whatever you want. Because you've earned it. You've saved yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. Mm -hmm. 
for this topic, I just wanted to go over it because it was a big one. Faith alone, but you won't find that in Scripture when it comes to salvation in this dispensation. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, you know, changing words in the Bible, like what we're talking about here, people quoting things wrong, misusing the Bible, not walking in craftiness, twisting scripture, misusing the Bible, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God, lowercase g, God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Right there we read, if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Salvation has to be found. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. You have to be seeking salvation, God's grace. You want to find it? The Bible tells you how. God will show you the truth on how to find His grace. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That is like the biggest misconception so far in the Bible. And it's... it's I've said it in other teachings, and I'm kind of going off a little bit, a little more than I wanted to for this video. It's all about the flesh. People want to have this world. This world's all about the flesh. It's all about sin, the lusts of the heart. That's all it's about, and people want that, and they want to have the insurance of saying, well, I'm going to heaven still because I believe in Jesus Christ, in a Jesus Christ, but not the Jesus Christ. And they like to change words, they like to add words, they like to misquote scripture. But there, like I said, that's another example of someone saying something, and then when you read the verse they use to back it up, it disproves what they're saying. It's not faith that saves you, it's God's grace that saves you. So what I wanted to do is just do a quick video to throw it out there to try to get some of the brethren involved, brothers and sisters in Christ, to put down a couple verses. You, you can go crazy if you want and put down tons. But throw a verse that you've come across in your life and you've experienced with other brethren, save people that are saying things wrong, or the lost world, and saying, hey, watch out for this, brothers and sisters in Christ. People will say this, but this is what the Bible actually says. Okay? I want to include the brethren. That's what this whole video is about. Just throw some verses in the comment section and let the fellowship continue. Don't argue with people. Don't get into debating with people. And when you realize that you have lost people trying to infiltrate, ignore them. Let them, let them alone. Okay, just let them alone. Okay? They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they will fall into the ditch. I'm paraphrasing, but uh, preach the gospel to them, and then get back to fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, this isn't a argue fest or debate fest. It's just throw out a verse and say, hey, I've heard people say this. But the verse actually says this, okay? I've heard people, you know, misquote it. People say this, and then they use this verse to back it up when the verse disproves what they're saying. So I wanted to hear from some of the brethren out there. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.